good morning. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Global Forum. My, my name's James Robinson. I'm the, the Institute uh, Director at the Pearson Institute and, and, and I'm very excited to be here and to welcome you all to this year's uh, forum with the theme of, well, information in conflict. I, I think the big theme is the digitization of our world and what does that mean for global conflict and its resolution. The, the Pearson Institute uh, was founded to study and try to understand the determinants of conflict and the resolution of conflict. And our idea is to bring together scholars and academics like myself and other faculty associated with the Institute, along with people from the policy world, people from civil society, practitioners, people who dealt with these conflicts in their daily and professional lives. And the Global Forum was where it all comes together. Unfortunately, it's all coming together virtually this year due to the pandemic, but, but, but we're very excited about doing it in person in Chicago next year. So, so rather than talk about, in these opening remarks, rather than talk about the details of this speaker or that speaker, we have an amazing, amazing panels, di different types of panels, looking at some of the bigger conceptual issues such as the commodification of information and that's going to be the, right after me Brittany Kaiser is going to talk about that talking about you know the profound implications of this digital revolution and techno, techno, modern technology for our lives for politics for the economy and also what we usually do at the global forum is kind of dive deep into different parts of the world and try to understand the specifics of the problems, maybe the specifics of the culture and the challenges, because, you know, conflict is very related to different cultures and different circumstances and different worldviews, if you like. And, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But, but, but so, so to understand the roots of conflict and how you resolve conflict in, in a serious way, uh, you need to get into those specifics and 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 that's that's something we try to do also try to work on these regional expertise and 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 so there's going to be stuff on the middle east and yemen and saudi arabia and it's going to be great uh, but but let me you know what do we do at the pearson institute you know what 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 do i do and what's that got let me i thought i'd just for five minutes talk about some of the things that i do and how that's related to global conflict and how how what I try to do bridges the academic world with with the policy world with the, the practical world and let, let me let me let me do it in in the context of a very concrete example which is in the news uh, very much at the moment which is the situation in Haiti so so Haiti uh, you know Haiti is 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 a kind of tragedy of, of, of history, of, of economic development. And I've been working for the past, uh, for the past five or six years with the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, helping them, sort of advising them on a project of what they call state building. So, so the, the, this is a, you know, one of the big conclusions in academic research is that one of the sources of conflict in the world today is what political scientists or economists would call kind of state weakness, the inability of the state to undertake basic tasks to provide order and public goods. And, and so, so I've been working with two ministries in Haiti with the Inter-American Development Bank to try to figure out how to make those ministries better at doing what they're supposed to do, how to motivate people better, how to identify goals and targets and what are the impediments within the ministries in terms of making them work better and but but of course all of that's collapsed at the moment if you've read the the newspapers uh, or the the internet <laughs> no one who reads newspapers anymore well, i do you know but 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 that's just my generation if you've read the the internet you know that life is almost unbearable in haiti at the moment especially in port au prince the level of violence disorder and kidnapping has gone through the roof. The Inter-American Development Bank, who I work with, has abandoned ship. They've closed down this enormous, beautiful office they have in Denmark and moved everyone to the Republica Dominicana over the border. There's nobody there. Uh, uh, 
you know, you can't function at the moment. It's not safe to travel anywhere. There's people blocking streets, kidnapping people. And, you know, and, and, and that's how do you understand that? How do you think about that? And in my own mind, I always relate it to a case which, which I think is similar, you know, which is Colombia. And you're going to hear about some of Chris Blackman's research in Colombia during the Global Forum. But I, I've been working for many, many years in Colombia. I've taught in Bogota every summer for 25 years. The first time I went to Colombia in 1992, it was a little bit like Porto Prince is today. Pablo Escobar had just es escaped from prison. Uh, you know, there was kidnapping crazy. Uh, Bogota, you couldn't go out at night. No cars would stop at a red light. It was just completely unsafe to go out at night. If you drove outside the city in the daytime, you had to duct tape big wads of pesos under the wheel arch, you know, just in case you had what the Colombians called an expression I found very entertaining, a pesca, una pesca milagrosa, like a magical fishing. They called stopping being robbed magical fishing, you know. So, 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 you know, you had to take precautions, anticipate. Everyone had bodyguards, security with guns. And, and you know, but when I think about that situation, I think about Haiti, there's enormous improvement in Colombia now. There's still many challenges. And, you know, what's interesting about Colombia is that the Colombians were able to kind of collectively understand they were in a mess. And there was a political response. The first political response was, oh, this is a, this is a consequence of the fact that we're a very unequal, uh, hierarchical kind of undemocratic society. So there was this impulse to kind of rewrite the constitution, to open the political system, to make things more democratic, to negotiate, to try to include, you know, even the crooks and the, and, and the, and the, and the, and the Marxist guerrillas, bring them all to the table and talk. Uh, people spent a lot of time trying to talk to Pablo Escobar. That didn't work very well. So the political system adjusted again, and they lurched in another direction, and people elected President Uribe, and President Uribe's solution was a very... Hobbesian, you know, like Leviathan, build up the army, crush the opposition. That had a lot of negative side effects, but, but I have to say, you know, in retrospect, it was more successful than the strategy of being kind of nice and, you know, trying to include and discuss, you know, that just somehow that just didn't work in Colombia. What I also find interesting, so that's, you know, when I think about Haiti, I think what seems different about Haiti is the political system somehow can't react in the way the Colombian political system could, could react to that situation. I also think about society. One thing that's interesting about Colombia is that to start with, you know, the government did nothing to solve these problems. So society self-organized to try to solve the problems themselves. Like in many ways, this resulted in paramilitarism and lots of other negative externalities, negative consequences too. But it also, had the effect of stabilizing uh, lots of things. And what's interesting is that that mobilization by society always regarded the state as legitimate, you know, and in 2006, it was possible to kind of demobilize all these people. But in Haiti also, you don't seem to see this social organization against the gangs and the kidnappers and the kind of anarchy. So, so I guess that's the sort of question that I think about, that we tend, to, we tend to think about, we tend to discuss. You know, what is it about a political system that allows it to respond to these social problems, that it allows it to identify the challenges citizens face and kind of adapt and propose different ideas and solutions and try them out? Okay, that didn't work. Let's, let's do something else. And what is it about the society that allows the society to kind of collectively recognize, oh, the government isn't doing what it ought to be doing. Let's, let's we organize, we self-organize, and we, we do it ourselves. We try to provide order ourselves. We provide public goods ourselves. You know, that, that's, those are sort of comparative questions uh, that, that, you know, in many ways we really don't understand the answer to. They're, they're, they're deep questions. You know, if you go back, and they're old questions, if you go back to Plato's, di you know, Plato's dialogue, Protagoras, he talks about, you know, God gave the arts and talent to humans, but the problem started when humans began living in cities. You know, then conflict started, there was a problem of order. And, you know, so since the days of Plato and Aristotle and probably before that, you know, we've been trying to understand conflict and the sources of conflict and 
and what brings order and, and, and to a society and what type of institutional design could do that and what type and it's a fundamentally political problem as Plato understood as the Colombians understood as the Haitians understand it's just that in some contexts it seems one can solve that problem or one can come up with a solution and in other contexts one can't I think you know if we think we've all been thinking about I'm sure everybody who's watching this video watching this 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 show has been thinking about Afghanistan and the project in Afghanistan and I, I'm going to have some more things to say about that in, in, in the little talk I'm going to give you're all going to see my flash talk uh, d developing this theme you know what was it about the project in Afghanistan which was somehow flawed and why was it so so unsu so unsuccessful at achieving its 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 goals and that's about political it's, it's institutions it's about how to build legitimate political institutions you know i mentioned colombian paramilitarism and one thing i find fascinating about colombian paramilitarism is that you know any paramilitary in colombia i've talked to they all see the government as being legitimate the government might be incompetent and the government is not doing what it's supposed to do but it's still the government of colombia it's the legitimate that's interesting so to be independent autonomous but to still regard the system as legitimate is also something fascinating uh that 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 we're trying to um study so so i think i'm just giving you a little flavor of the type of questions that we ask at the pearson institute and and, and what what we're interested in and where we'd like to go and i think that example i gave you that comparison between haiti and colombia they're both intellectually kind of fascinating questions in social science but they're also questions of immense practical importance in the world you know how do i deal with these problems okay so so i'm gonna i'm gonna shut up uh, next we're gonna go go back to the theme we're gonna have Brittany kaiser uh, one of the co-founders of your own data talking about the commodification of information <laughs>